All right. Well, last week, remember, Paul reminded us that God offers the gospel to everyone. He offers his salvation to everyone. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why, again, we do the work of missions, the way we do the work of evangelism, and why we should be reminded that we don't have to know in advance uh, whom the Lord has chosen and whom not, that we may invite anyone and everyone to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, Paul reminded us that before anyone actually ever will come, they do have to hear Christ. He said in verse 14 of um, chapter 10, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard, not of whom or about whom, but whom they have not heard? They need to hear his life-giving voice that raises the dead. And of course, the only way they can hear it is through the gospel. Now, in these chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, we need to remember that Paul is dealing with the question of Jewish salvation. Have God's promises to them failed? And so he raised the question in chapter 10, have the Jews heard? You know, you can't hear Christ speaking unless you hear the gospel, but have the Jews heard the gospel? Well, he said, yes, they have. They heard it in the Old Testament. In, he, remember last, last week we saw through the law, uh, through the prophets, through the writings. The Old Testament is full of the gospel, as John Owen reminded us already, I think it was last week in the evening, that uh, it's not a different religion in the Old Testament. It's the same religion. You know, it's, it's Christianity. It's trusting in Christ. He has always been the only way of salvation. So yes, they heard the gospel through, again, the promises and the types and the shadows. But let's not forget, Jesus also preached it to them for three and a half years in Palestine. And then by this time, Paul had taken the gospel to all the Jews in the Roman Empire, at least beginning those works that would ultimately bring it to all the Jews. So yes, they had heard. The only thing missing was the internal call, Christ's powerful, life-giving voice, or that work of the Holy Spirit that raises us from the dead. Now, the question Paul addresses this morning in the main is this. Why didn't they hear his voice? Why didn't the Lord call them? Now, this, this is what he began to answer last week, but does so now more fully. It's because of his plan to save the Gentiles. Okay? All right. Now, first of all, Paul wants to tell us or remind us that, that not all Israel has turned a deaf ear to the gospel, that he has spoken to some. He begins with the question, I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? Now this question expects a negative answer, and so he gives one, may it never be. Which, you know, is the strongest possible way in the Greek language, again, to deny the possibility of something. And he proves this by pointing to himself, that he was an Israelite. He was a child of Abraham. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Here was at least one Jew who had heard his voice. But of course, there were many others at that time. Let's not forget the, the disciples you know, were, were Jewish. Uh, the apostles were Jewish. Um, the early Christian church, the thousands that were converted on the day of Pentecost and subsequent times, those were all Jewish. So God has not rejected his people. But Paul does want to narrow down what he means by this in verse 2, we need to understand that he's not talking about Israel, the natural Israel as a whole, but he's talking about the people he foreknew, the people that he has chosen, those whom he has foreloved, those whom he has predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, as Paul told us in Romans 8, verse 29. Paul appeals to the days of Elijah, when it looked to the prophet as though he was the only faithful Israelite left. They have torn down your altars. They've all forsaken you. They're all worshiping Baal. But God told him, no, there were still 7,000 who belonged to him. 7,000 who had heard his voice, who had not bowed their knee to Baal. And Paul says the same is true in our day. 
God always has his remnant, his chosen, according to his grace. Well, this is where the Jews failed. They thought, remember, that God makes his choice on the basis of what we do rather than on the basis of a choice he makes, a gracious choice. That's why Paul interjects in verse 6, which almost seems out of place, but if it is by grace, that is, if it is by God's gracious choice, this remnant of people who are listening to the voice of Christ, who've trusted him and who are saved, if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Paul is reminding us here again that grace and works are on pol they're polar opposites. They're mutually exclusive. If God gives salvation as a gift, it is not something that can be earned. But that's exactly what Israel was trying to do, the natural branches, the natural Jews. They were seeking God's blessings through their works. And that's why Paul says Israel did not find what it was they were looking for. You know, they wanted God's kingdom. They wanted his salvation. But they were looking for it down the road of works. So they failed. That which Israel was seeking, they did not obtain. But notice, Paul again says, they didn't all fail. Those who were chosen received what Israel was seeking after, God's kingdom, and again, his salvation. They received Christ and what was promised in him. By the way, that's a very, very important concept there, a very important passage. And I don't want to get sidetracked, but I do want to make one, mention one thing. That there are many in the church today who believe that when the Jews rejected Jesus, God put his plan for them on hold. Does that sound familiar? And he started something entirely new, okay, the church age. Those who believe that believe that none of the Jews received what God had promised them that the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is still future for all the Jews. But I want you to notice that isn't the case because Paul says here that which Israel was seeking, natural Israel, the, the blessings of, of the covenants that God had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had not received, but those who were chosen did receive it, what God had promised to them. And what he had promised was salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, and an inheritance in his kingdom. And all, I'm, what I'm trying to point out here is that God doesn't have two plans for two different peoples. He has one plan. Right now, we are receiving the blessings that God had promised to Israel. You know, and that's, that's the whole point of this, of this passage. How is he going to provoke Israel to jealousy if we're not receiving what God had promised to them? If it's something entirely different, how would that work? Well, it wouldn't work. What's going to make them jealous is the fact that the Gentiles have received the blessings God promised to Israel. Now, what about those who didn't receive what Israel was seeking? Who didn't receive what God promised? Paul says in verse 7, the rest of them were hardened. And he quotes several Old, Ta Old Testament passages to show us that that was God's plan all along, just as he hardened Pharaoh's heart not by injecting more evil into his heart, but by using the evil that was in Pharaoh's heart, by loosening his restraints on the evil that was in Pharaoh's heart. So he hardened the Jews. Now, <clears throat> this brings us to the second point. Why did God harden them? I mean, if his point is to save them, why is he hardening them judicially? Okay, well, he can do that because that is the righteous response to their unbelief. But the question is, that Paul raises next is, is God finished with them? Does this hardening mean that he has cast them away? Paul says, no. He did this because of his plan to save his elect from the Gentiles, to save us, and through saving us, to save his elect among the Jews by provoking them to jealousy. So he asks in verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? That is, they didn't fall away from God forever through this stumbling over Christ. Again, his question expects a negative answer, and he gives one. May it never be. 
<clears throat> There's no way that could possibly happen. God is not finished with the Jews. He still has a plan to save some of them, okay? Not all of them. If, if the remnant, you know, teaches us anything in the history of Israel, it teaches us that God never had a plan to save all of Abraham's physical children. But he does have a plan to save all of his spiritual children. He has a plan to save some, but the way he would do it is by turning to the Gentiles, turning to us, that he might make them jealous. Now, at this point, Paul can't help but look ahead uh, to consider the outcome of this work okay, that God is doing. So he says in verse 12, Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, if through their rejection of Jesus Christ, the gospel has come to us, giving us the riches of their blessings, salvation in him. He says, how much more will their fulfillment be? How much more blessing will we receive when God has gathered all of his elect from among them? Okay, and this is going to become a little bit clearer in a moment, but Paul is talking about what's going to happen at the end of this plan, you know, this partial hardening and turning to the Gentiles, provoking them to jealousy, gathering, gathering them all together. What's the end going to be? Well, it's going to be blessing. It's going to be greater blessing, greater than receiving the gospel. Okay? What that is, we'll see in a moment. Now, notice that this is why Paul says he gloried in the ministry that God had given to him. To be the apostle to the Gentiles. You ever wondered why Paul, you know, as a Jew... Um, enjoyed so much ministering to the Gentiles and, um, I mean, just really loved doing that. What, what was the reason? It's because of how his ministry to them would affect his people, the Jews, and how that would result in greater blessing for the Gentiles, for us. So Paul loved ministering the gospel to us because it would provoke the Jews to jealousy and when they're provoked to jealousy and they receive what God had promised to them, that was going to result in more blessing for us. He knew that as the Gentiles came to Christ and received the blessings God had promised the Jews in Him, that it would provoke them to jealousy. And what does that, what does that mean? Well, seeing us enjoy God's presence in our lives and the blessings of communion with Him. By the way, which we're going to learn more about that this evening in Owen's theology. Seeing our relationship with God, that would cause the elect among them to turn to Jesus. Now, I want you to notice here that the Lord is using motives, isn't He, to bring people to Himself. He's not just simply giving the Spirit to people in a vacuum and zapping them with life out of the blue. But, but when he brings somebody to himself, he, he stirs them, he moves them, he moves their affections. He makes them want to come to him. He gives them reasons, reasons of the heart, okay? And jealousy is certainly one of those. When they see our loving relationship with the God that they claim to worship and don't really have that relationship because of the way they're pursuing it, because they're not pursuing it in Christ, it will move them then to jealousy. Now again, Paul in verse 15 can't help but look ahead to the glorious results of this plan. Again, this plan that we've been talking about. If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, okay, if their unbelief has brought the gospel to us, to the nations, to the Gentiles, he says, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, we might tend to think that Paul here is speaking about spiritual resurrection, you know. Um, if, if their rejection brings the gospel to us, <clears throat> their acceptance will bring about a spiritual resurrection in their, in their lives. But that's not really what he's talking about because, you know, ultimately they would have to be raised spiritually before they could even receive the Lord Jesus Christ. So by receiving him, they're not raised to life. They're raised to life to receive him. And it also doesn't really 
parallel what he says about their rejection bringing riches to the Gentiles. But if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be for us and for them but life from the dead? That is, their rejection will bring an even greater blessings. Now again, uh, what is he talking about here? Well, when, when all the elect Gentiles have been saved and all the elect Jews have been saved, then the Lord will bring about life from the dead. He will come to raise us all to eternal life. Now, don't we already possess eternal life? Well, the answer is yes. If we've trusted in Jesus, we, we do have eternal life. But eternal life, remember, is not just a length of life. It is a quality of life. And we are enjoying part of that right now. We have a down payment of, of the full inheritance you know, just, just that, that down payment of the Holy Spirit. But in the future, when Jesus comes again, we are going to receive the full inheritance. And that's what he's referring to here, this life from the dead when Jesus comes again, because he will come again, <clears throat> excuse me, once all his chosen, once all Israel is gathered together. Okay, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense. So then, Paul says, what should our attitude be toward the Jews as Gentiles who are saved? Toward, I think he's talking here about the natural Jews, the natural branches. First, Paul tells us we need to see that even though they rejected Christ, they are still holy to the Lord. And, and that's something that, you know, that we have a hard time maybe grasping, but let's not forget that God did bring into covenant with himself Abraham and, his, and his, all of his offspring. And Paul's going to elaborate on that right now, which means that all of the Jews are holy, and even though they're enemies to God, they're still holy to him. So oh, we're going to see more about that. They are yet his people because of God's relationship with their forefathers, and that's what Paul is addressing in these two analogies. The first one in verse 16 if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. If, if the patriarchs, who were the first uh, among the, you know, the, the Jews to come to the Lord, if they were holy to the Lord because of his covenant with them, and holy means he has set them apart to be his people, then their children are as well. I don't think there's any debate about that. Okay? And then he says in verse 16, if the root is holy... The branches are too, and I think he's describing the same thing, perhaps here singling out Abraham, because God first made his covenant with him. If the root of this whole tree, which is God's covenant with Abraham, if, if the root is holy, then the branches are as well. In other words, the Jews are. Now, secondly, because they're holy, he says we should not become arrogant, that we have what God promised them, and they don't, okay? We shouldn't look down on them because they rejected Christ and forfeited the blessings of, of his covenant while we have received him and have become his heirs. He says, you need to remember, I need to remember, we need to remember that we do not support the root. Okay? God did not make the promises to us. He made them to Abraham, you know, the promises that are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not support the root. The root supports us. We are blessed because of God's free grace to us in giving the blessings that he promised to Abraham because God has given them to us in Christ. Now, he says it's true that branches were broken off. Okay, Jews were hardened and they were removed so that we might be grafted in, so that the Lord might turn to us in his grace. But rather than being arrogant, Paul says, Instead, be afraid. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If he was willing to remove the natural branches for their unbelief, how much more will he remove us if we should fall into the same sin of unbelief? Now, I do have to stop and, and address a particular question that arises at this point. What is Paul talking about here? Is he talking about Losing your salvation? Well, no, that can never happen to a true believer, right? 
That only happens to false professors. True believers will persevere to the end. The Bible is very, very clear on that point. We cannot lose our salvation. So we need to see that Paul is using this image of an olive tree to refer to the visible church, okay, the covenant community, those who are professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what we call the visible expression of God's kingdom on earth. We can't be removed from the invisible church. You know, if we're elect and we're trusting in Christ, we'll never lose our salvation. But we can be removed from the visible church. We can be removed from the covenant community. And that's what he's talking about here. Not that we can lose our salvation. He's warning us here against the sin of unbelief. The same sin that caused the Jews to be removed. They were in that covenant relationship with God in the visible church by birth because they were related to Abraham. But now Jesus comes, they don't trust in him, those branches are bringing, broken off, they're being removed from the continuing church, which is the new covenant church. And only professing Jews can be in that along with professing Gentiles, but again, they may not be true professors, and they may yet fall away. And so that's why this warning is here. Now Paul calls us to reflect for a moment on God's character. He says, God has been kind to you. He has rejected his own people, the Jews, for you and for me, giving us what he promised them. God is infinitely gracious and merciful. We do not deserve any of these things, but he has been pleased to give them to us in Christ by his free grace. But he also pauses to call our attention to God's severity. The Jews were cut off for their unbelief. They were cut off from their own tree. They were cut off from God's promises to them, His covenant with them. Paul is, is warning us again not to fall from Him, but to persevere to the end. Remember, perseverance of the saints does not mean that there's nothing for us to do. It doesn't mean we just kind of walk along and suddenly we go into heaven someday. But we need to be working on putting our sins to death and pushing forward in the kingdom of heaven and growing in Christ's likeness and our love for God and our service to God. And we know that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will give us the power to do this. Now, thinking about these branches that have been broken off, he reminds us again of God's grace. He also says in verse 23, if the Jews don't continue in their unbelief, if they repent and receive Christ... He will bring them back into the tree. He will graft them back in. He will bring them back into the church. If he can do this with wild olive branches, with the Gentiles, as we saw in Ephesians 2, we were far off from God, but he's brought us near through Christ. If he can do that, he can certainly bring the natural branches back into their own tree through faith and repentance. Now that tells us that there's always hope, even for those branches that do get broken off, you know, from the church and are excommunicated, because that's what Paul's talking about here is excommunication from the church, branches being broken off and removed. They can be brought back in. That's not the end, just like it isn't the end for the, for the Jews. The majority of them were excommunicated, but the Lord is working to bring some of them back in. And the same thing is true with regard to Gentiles as well. If, if for some reason we or somebody we know gets excommunicated. That doesn't mean that they can't be brought back into the church. There is hope. That's not the unpardonable sin that one is excommunicated for, and it was not the unpardonable sin for the Jews. That is a much more serious sin, the unpardonable sin. So finally, Paul returns to his main point, and that is how God is saving his true Israel, his elect Jews and Gentiles. Paul says that this partial hardening, remember not all of Israel, the natural branches were broken off. There were some that remained in, some that had heard his voice, some that had been born again, had trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But those, the majority of them that were hardened, this partial hardening, he says, of Israel will continue until he's brought in the fullness of the Gentiles. I'm in verse 25 now. Now remember, he hardened Israel that he might turn to the, to the Gentiles. And he turned to the Gentiles 
that he might provoke Israel to jealousy to receive Christ. Now he's saying that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all his chosen from among the nations, the world, all, all non-Jews, when all non-Jews have been saved, then that partial hardening of Israel is going to come to an end. And the reason is because by this time he will have brought in all of his chosen from among them. Okay, remember, he's hardening Israel to turn to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. And once he's brought all of these people in, it's because his plan has succeeded to bring all of the elect Jews, provoking them to jealousy, to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the process. Okay. This, he is, this is what he's saying, how all Israel is going to be saved. When all this has taken place, um, all Israel will have been saved. Okay, what, I, what I'd like to do is say, just, just say this for, for a moment. Okay, he isn't saying, again, as many you know, well-meaning Christians today believe, he's not saying here that after he's gathered all the Gentiles that he intends to save, that he's going to then turn to all the natural Jews and save them through a seven-year tribulation period. Okay? That he's not saying, and then all Israel is going to be saved in verse 26, but he's saying this is the way that all Israel is going to be saved. And what he's referring to is that Israel that he referred to in chapter 9, verse 6, the Israel that is not descended from natural Israel. Remember, that Israel is not made up of all natural branches. It is made up of wild olive branches and natural branches, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. What he's talking about here is the process by which he is bringing all of his elect to salvation and gathering them all together, both Jews and Gentiles, into his Israel, the spiritual Israel, okay? And that's exactly what he said he would do, verses 26 and 27, through the Old Testament prophets. And once this is done, as we saw earlier, Jesus is going to return to bring in the greater riches of the new heavens and the new earth that we will enjoy with him forever. Okay, I think those Old Testament passages he quotes after verse um, 25 are ta is talking about the Old Testament said this is what Jesus would do. He would come into the world and he would gather together his elect people, remove ungodliness from Jacob. But we need to understand that that Jacob is made up of Jews and Gentiles. So again, how does Paul say we should view the Jews? I, at the very end of this, he's kind of wrapping everything up. Well, he says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Okay, right now, the Jews are hostile towards us. Uh, you know, not as a nation, not as an unbelieving nation. You know, there are Jews that aren't, you know, dyed in the wool, you know, willing to go to the wall for their religion. There, there are those that are more liberal, and they're not the ones that are going to be our enemies, but the ones that take their religion very seriously, Okay. Well, they're, they're going to be hostile toward us. They're our enemies because they think our Christianity is a perversion of the truth. It's strange, isn't it? Because Paul just told us that God has turned to us with the gospel to provoke them to jealousy, but it seems more like it's making them our enemies, our, you know, making them angry. That's why we have to see that that provoking to jealousy will only affect those that God is speaking to the voice that raises the dead, only to his elect. The rest of them are going to be our enemies, aren't they? They're going to hate us, okay? So that right now, that we, we can understand that. But this other part, how do we understand this? Verses 28 and 29. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Once God makes a promise, he doesn't take it back. Now, I do think Paul is likely referring to the elect among them, but I do think God still largely deals with all the Jews for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, they are still his people because of their connection to the patriarchs, but God still has his elect among them, and they are beloved. Notice he says, from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved. 
So, you know, you wonder about Paul. He had this, this great love for the Jews, uh, even willing to be condemned so that they might be saved. And how can he do that when they are his enemies and, and they're constantly persecuting him? Well, it's because he understood that there were those among them that God loved. And that's why he loved them. But I think his love extended beyond just the elect. I think he, he loved all the natural branches. Well, God loves them. Paul loved them, right? And we should love them, okay? Because one day, especially with regard to the elect, one day we're going to all be joined together in one family in the household of God. So then Paul concludes by summarizing his whole argument in verses 30 through 35. We were once disobedient, but we have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. Okay? They rejected the gospel. He turned to us. So because of their disobedience, we have been shown mercy. So now they are disobedient and may be shown mercy because of the mercy that was shown to us. God's been merciful to us, and now he can be merciful to them. In verse 32, for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. And, you know, Paul, he, he's just looking at what God is doing. And as he thinks about it, he's overwhelmed by the wisdom of God, by the, the knowledge of God, how he's able to bring all these things about that he has in the way that he has. And as he thinks about these things, he ends in doxology, which means worship to God. In verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things, all this, this grace, all this mercy, all this salvation, it's all coming from him. So he says, to him be the glory forever. You know, God alone deserves the glory because it all comes from him. None of it comes from us. The Jews want to rob God of his glory by thinking that Somehow they're going to work to make themselves good enough for God to accept them, but that's not going to work. It's purely of His grace, purely of His choice. It all comes from Him, so He gets all the glory for all of these things. That's what, again, Top Lady was very jealous of when he was writing against Arminianism. Arminianism, the idea that man has something to do with his salvation, was robbing God of some of His glory. And so he was trying to take that back and say, no, God has done it all. We give all the glory to him. Do not rob God of his glory. We need to make sure that we do the same thing, that we glorify him. Give him the credit. Give him the honor. Give him the praise. Give him the thanks and the love that belongs to him. Okay? And that's really what we need to be thinking about as we come to the table this morning you know, we did not ascend into heaven to bring Christ down, as he reminded us last week. We didn't descend into the pit to bring Christ up. This is something God did from first to last. It is his work. And so we give him all the glory and all the praise for these things and all the love. So let's meditate on that. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table, um, giving him praise and thanks.